Alright, so good afternoon everyone. Thank you for coming inside and away from the nice lovely weather outside to uh, talk SQL Server for another hour. Uh, so this is using SQL Server 2012's Always On uh, feature. So it, this is one of the very cool new features uh, that's being introduced in SQL Server 2012. And personally one of my favorite things to play with in SQL Server and to talk about. Because it's fairly easy to demo fairly easily. Uh, you guys have seen all that. So what is Always On? Uh, so Always On is a new, new feature, like I mentioned yesterday during the keynote. Uh, been introduced in SQL Server 2012. Uh, unfortunately, this is an enterprise only feature, um, but it is worth it if you need a system or a solution that's going to get you very, very high, available, high availability. Uh, so, when Microsoft was putting this feature together, they basically took some of the best concepts from clustering, the best technologies from Windows clustering, and combined them with the best technologies and concepts from database mirroring. They kind of smashed them together and came up with this feature that we call Always On. Uh, you will, on occasion, hear it referred to as Hader, H-A-D-R, or Hadron, H-A-D-R-O-N. Um, Hader was the code name. Uh, it just stands for High Availability Disaster Recovery. Um, the reason I mention that, and we normally don't talk about code names once a product's released, is the fact that there are some dynamic management views that still have the code name in the name of the object. Uh, so you will, you will actually see this code name floating around probably forever. Um, the reason for that is marketing couldn't get their act together and get a name picked for it by the time they had to start locking code in uh, during the beta cycles, or during the development cycle rather. So we end up with objects. Some objects have always on in the name, some objects have Peter in the name. So like I mentioned, this does use parts of clustering and parts of database mirroring. Uh, so the parts of clustering that we're going to be using are the failover clustering APIs and share a couple of shared resources. And those shared resources are simply a network name and an IP address. The really cool thing about Always On, um, I think I mentioned this in the keynote yesterday, is there is no requirement for shared storage anymore. Uh, in fact, when I, sh when I flip over and do the, my demo uh, towards the end of the session, you'll actually see that all my virtual machines only have a C drive. I have no shared storage configured on these VMs. Uh, so all you know, there's, there's no magic here as far as data replication goes. We don't need to have this ridiculously expensive investment in enterprise class storage. We can do all of this with uh, you know just locally attached storage, so we don't have to spend the extra hundreds of thousands of dollars just buying storage. So like I mentioned, we do have a shared IP address, which we're going to be using in the, in the availability group listener. This is an optional configuration step that is highly recommended. Um, what the availability group listener does is it gives you a single point of contact that your end user is going to connect to. So without the availability group listener, you have to tell your end users which physical server they're going to go connect to. With the availability group listener, it's simply going to have that network name and IP address running on whichever box is currently running as the primary active copy of the data. A Windows clustering is going to be what's failing, is going to be what's handling the failover back and forth of that network name and IP address. So the reason that we're using Windows clustering and not using the old legacy technology in database mirroring is the Windows, uh, the SQL Server team got together with the clustering team and realized that the clustering guys have been writing application failover logic and application failover code for about 15 years now. The SQL Server guys have been doing it for about six. So why are they why are they trying to reinvent the wheel? Why not just leverage something that they're already already extremely familiar with using anyway and rip out all the code that they, they had that they no longer need, which is what they ended up doing. So we're not really using any code from database mirroring as a part of the always on feature as database mirroring has been totally deprecated. Um, we are using a lot of concepts from database mirror, specifically the data transmission. Um, we're using the exact same methodology for moving data from one server to another. Basically, we're sending a transaction log stream in real time if it's synchronous or near real time if it's asynchronous between the primary server and one or more secondary servers. 
The really nice thing here is while database mirroring is limited to just a single copy, uh, with always on, we're, we're, we can have up to four secondary copies floating around, and some of those can be synchronous and some can be asynchronous. The other piece that we are going to be using from or reusing from database mirroring is the TCP endpoint that database mirroring would be using today. So if you took a SQL Server 2008 R2 infrastructure using database mirroring, upgraded it to SQL Server 2012, and converted from database mirroring to always on, you'd actually use the exact same endpoint. Um, that is the one piece that we are reusing, is the fact it's just that endpoint that database mirroring used, was using to connect. So if you look at an always on configuration, and you see that the endpoint is named uh, endpoint underscore mirror, that's an old database mirroring infrastructure that was upgraded. If it's HADR underscore endpoint, that was an endpoint created through the always on configuration wizard, or somebody renamed it one of the two. So like all the new technology that Microsoft introduces, they like to give us some new terminology that we need to know. Uh, so I'm actually going to start at the bottom of this list and work my way up, because that's the easiest way to talk about these. So the first is the availability databases. So the availability databases are the databases that we're going to be making available with the always on solution. So those databases go into data are living within what are called availability replicas. The availability replica is just a name for the instances that are going to be hosting the availability databases. The availability databases and the availability replicas are grouped together into availability groups. The, the availability group is simply a logical container that holds these other objects. It also contains the availability group listener that I mentioned a couple of slides ago. So you can have multiple databases in a single availability group. You can obviously have multiple replicas in a, a single availability group. And you can have multiple availability groups on a single server. So you, we no longer have that requirement we have database mirroring where we're failing a single database over at a time. We can now fail multiple databases over as a group from one instance to another. Uh, so in my demo, there's going to be one database, but it works exactly the same if you have one database or multiple databases. Uh, so there are some uh, pretty stringent requirements for getting this all set up. Um, all your instances must be installed on Windows 2008, Enterprise Edition or higher. It says R2 on the screen here, and technically R2 is not required. It will work on Windows Server 2008, release one, but it's not recommended. The reason for that is what I mentioned in the keynote yesterday, where the product teams um, for Windows and the product team for SQL are going to be doing a lot of work together to get new patches put together specifically for Always On, and we've already had one of those come out. But that patch has only been released for Windows 2008 R2, because that's where they're going to be putting the bulk of their focus, because that's where most of the people are going to be deploying this today. All the servers that are going to be deployed as a single always on deployment or a single always on availability group all have to be configured within the same Windows cluster. Now, SQL Server itself does not necessarily need to be clustered. It can be to give an additional level of availability and redundancy. But that does introduce the requirement for shared storage, because you're now talking traditional Windows clustering, as well as always on clustering on top of that. Another requirement is that your databases must be in full recovery mode. The bulk log and simple recovery mode are not going to be supported. Now, you can use any supported database compatibility level. So if your application requires your database to be running compatibility level 90, for example, that is going to work just fine under Always on. Always on also works very well with contained databases, so you can actually make use of the contained logins feature or the contained users feature rather of the uh, contained databases along with always on to make it easier to get your family or set up so you don't have to worry about getting logins set up on all your on all your instances that are hosting these databases. Uh, so I mentioned earlier, you can have multiple databases in a single availability group. Uh, I do like to point out that the I/O profiles that you're going to see on both your primary and your secondary servers are going to be very, very different. Uh, if you were to open up Performance Monitor on the primary and secondary server and watch the number of writes that are going down to your database files, you'll see that they are a very, very different profile. Your, product, your, your normal active server, your primary server, is going to look very normal. 
like you would expect to see it today. It's going to be you know bouncing around really low, and then you know when checkpoint kicks in, it's going to you know go up real high, move across until checkpoint's finished, and then drop back down and, and go back along really low again. On your secondary servers, on the other hand, if you were to look at that same performance metric counter for the data files, it's actually going to be up fairly high the entire time. And the reason for that is the SQL Server is going to be constantly checkpointing on those secondary servers. Pretty much every time transactions come in and pages are dirtied in the right buffer on the secondary servers, they're going to be hardened down to the disk for a checkpoint. And the reason for that is to speed up the failover when the always-on availability group fails over and the database needs to be brought online on the secondary server. So when that failover does happen, instead of reading through all the VLFs to try to bring the thing online, SQL Server at that point just needs to read the last VLF, make sure those last transactions were committed, then bring the database online, then roll back any transactions that were not, that were not successfully completed. Uh, matching hardware is not required, and in some configurations it would actually be recommended not to have matching hardware, depending on what you're doing. As this is an enterprise-only feature, we are talking about CPU-based licensing here, CPU core-based licensing here. So if you want to use some of your read-only servers, or some of your secondary servers for read-only purposes, like say to take backups on so you can offload your backups from, a, from your primary server, you would probably not want a big expensive server with a whole lot of CPUs on it to do that. You'd probably want a much smaller server with only a couple of CPUs, just the minimum to get the thing up and running, so that you don't have to pay for all those additional licenses. So on this slide here, I've got a couple of different diagrams that I want to talk about. These are a couple of different configuration options that are available to you. Uh, so I want to go ahead and start with the one closer to me, which is with the four independent servers on it. So this is a more traditional deployment methodology for always on. So we've obviously got a picture here of the US uh, on the, the two servers next to each other. Those are somewhere in the, the Carolina, the North Carolina area. Uh, the one in the middle is uh, somewhere around Alabama, and then the one on the right is in Northern California. So there's two servers that are next to each other, and then also to the, replicating to the one in Alabama, we're, go, we're using synchronous replication. So all three of those instances will be exactly the same at all times, no matter what. So we will be able to fail over to either one of those instances automatically without any risk of any data loss whatsoever. In the event that we lost those two data centers, both the one in North Carolina and the one in Alabama, we can manually fail over to the data center running up in Northern California. While there would be some data loss, it would not fail over to that automatically. That's one of the important things to remember about always on when you're configuring it. If you are doing asynchronous replication to a site, Microsoft will never fail over to that site automatically. They never fail over to that replica automatically. Microsoft is never going to make the decision for you to lose data. If there's a potential for data loss, automatic failover will automatically be, be disabled. So you'll have to make that decision to bring that system online and run the risk of having data loss. Now the configuration we have on the right hand side is a little more advanced configuration. This is taking Windows clustering, or you know, traditional SQL Server clustering, and mixing it with always on. So in this configuration we've got three servers out in uh, probably Atlanta or somewhere. We've got three more servers in Texas, and we've got one server up in Seattle or Oregon or something. So the three servers over on the east coast of the country, those are configured as a single Three node Windows cluster or SQL Server cluster instance. The three in the middle are configured exactly the same. So this is actually out of straight out of a reference architecture that one of the client, that one of the Microsoft customers was using uh, when they were de when they deployed Always On during the uh, release candidate process. So the reason that they have three servers in each of those two sites instead of two is that their management dictate, their management mandate is that in the event that either any server is offline in one of their primary two data centers, they must still have uh, physical hardware redundancy in that site. So they want with three servers in, in Texas and three servers uh, in their primary data center out in Atlanta. So that way they can reboot a server and not have any worries. So the way this would work is the, the, there's a single SQL instance 
in Atlanta on the right hand side, there's a single SQL instance in Texas, and then there's a single SQL instance out on the west coast of out of Oregon. And then, so it's three replicas, the primary being in Atlanta, with asynchronous replication going out to both Texas and then to Oregon as well. So as you can see between these two options, we've got lots of replication options on how we can configure this. It's all a matter of how much availability, how much scalability and flexibility you want to put into this, and really how much thought you want to put into this configuration as well. When you start getting into the advanced components like this, there's a lot of extra configuration and extra network configuration that needs to be thought about to make sure that you don't end up in any sort of split brain situation and to make sure that your automatic failovers are going to work as you expect them to in the event of an outage. Um, while we can test and plan um, a lot of this in theory, what a lot of the stuff comes down to is we actually have to build it and break it and see what happens to do our, a proper set of testing. Because there are literally thousands of different variables that you may need to, to deal with, especially at the network level, to make sure that you're not worrying about split brain in the environment and, and ending up having two active servers. Uh, so like I mentioned earlier, the data transfer is all done through the database mirroring endpoint. Um, if you do go through the wizard to get this all set up, the wizard will automatically create the endpoints and set up the necessary certificate-based security to get them set up correctly to encrypt the data between the, between the servers. Um, obviously, we're using the same concepts with database mirroring, so we will be encrypting all the data as it's transmitted over the wire. Uh, whether you're using something like transparent data encryption or not, your data will always be encrypted when it's being transferred between instances. So there are three ways to configure this thing. Uh, you can obviously use Management Studio, which is what I'm going to show you as part of the demo today. Um, that is obviously the easiest way to do it, but probably not the recommended way to do it for a production release. Uh, if you're a PowerShell kind of person, you obviously can use PowerShell. There are commandments to take care of everything, and I've got those on the next slide. And if you prefer to use T-SQL to configure everything so it's scriptable and easy to read in a normal SQL Server environment, you've got the Create Availability Group and Alter Availability Group T-SQL statements which have been introduced. And those two statements are going to handle all your creation of your availability groups. So PowerShell introduced eight new commandlets as part of this configuration. Four of them are used to set up uh, always on. Two of them are used to to dismantle it once you, if you've decided you're not going to use it or if you're going to dismantle it and rebuild it. And then two are used to actually manage it. The two used to manage it are suspend SQL availability group and switch SQL availability group. So if you get to a point where you need to pause replication for some reason, maybe you're doing network testing and the network is going to be going up and down or something like that, and you simply want to stop all data transmission for a little while, you simply use suspend SQL availability group, pass it the availability group object that you want to suspend, and hit down, and then it'll simply suspend it. If you want to fail over in PowerShell, that's where the switch SQL availability group is going to come from. Whatever server you're running that statement from is going to become the primary, is basically the way that works. And again, you just pass it in a computer object, or not a computer object, rather an availability group object to get to a tell which uh, availability group you're going to fail over. Now you'll notice there's no get availability group commandlet listed up there, and that's because they didn't bother to build one. Uh, they instead say you need to use get item to get the actual availability group object from PowerShell into a variable, and then pass that into any of these uh, commandlets. So obviously I don't expect you to read that, it is kind of complex, uh, but that is the basic uh, PowerShell. Uh, code that you would use to build an always on build delivery. Uh, feel free to grab the slide after the slide deck uh, for me, just shoot me an email, or uh, I'll post up on my blog as well. Uh, and you can just use that list and, and look at this code in more detail. So, like I mentioned, uh, we can, obviously we can control failover if we want to manually fail things over. Say, for example, we, we're going to reboot a server, so we want to make it up to no longer be the primary. We want to do that after hours, maybe we we'll plan to reboot the server the next day, we want to install patching, we we'll do a memory upgrade or something like that. So we need to man we want to manually do the failover so we can control when it's going to happen. Uh, easiest way to do that is going to be through SSMS. There's a, ni a nice uh, dashboard that you can use that you can fail that over with, or a wizard you can run through as well. Or you can use the PowerShell commandlet or the T-SQL statement alter availability that I mentioned earlier. 
So what can we use always on for? Uh, redundancy is kind of its default nature. So we can obviously use it to provide redundancy and availability for our application. One of the really cool features of always on is the fact that those secondary servers, we can use them for stuff now. With database mirroring, if we wanted to use a secondary server, basically all we can do is take a snapshot of it and use that snapshot for point in time reporting. We can now use the secondary servers for pretty much anything we want, as long as it doesn't involve actually writing data to the database. <laughs> so on my secondary servers, I can run queries. I can take backups. I can run DBCC check DB. Um, I can do pretty much anything I need to. Using a feature within Always On called read-only routing, I can actually route queries that I know are going to be read-only to a secondary server, so I can take workloads off of my primary server, giving me kind of a bit of a scale-out functionality as part of my Always On configuration. I'll actually show that to you as part of the demo as well. So this slide is actually wrong. There are only four secondary servers. I don't know how I ended up the five on the list. So there are support for up to four secondary servers for a total of five servers in the environment. Two of them, uh, three of them can be synchronous, or up to all four of them can be asynchronous. And you can mix and match however you want. You also predefine which of those three synchronous servers you want to be available as secondary, as uh, automatic failover servers. So you tell it which servers you want to fail over to. And you can actually configure which order you want them to fail over to as well. You can configure which, back, which servers you want backup to be taken on as part of the configuration, which I'll show you when I, when I get to the demo portion. And I mentioned the rest of these already. So licensing. This is always a big question with Always On. Um, when SQL Server 2012 was released back in April, there was a whole lot of gray area and a whole lot of unknowns when it came to licensing the Always On feature. So a lot of this has been cleared up at this point. And unfortunately, it's not being cleared up in a way that we as DBAs want it to be cleared up, or as customers want it to be cleared up. Because it involves spending lots and lots of money and giving it to Microsoft. So like I mentioned, this is an enterprise-only feature. So all the instances that are going to be involved as replicas do need to be enterprise edition of SQL Server 2012. If you're going to be using read-only nodes, or if you're going to use your secondary nodes for something, they must be licensed. So if you're going to run just regular T-SQL cores on them, they need to be licensed. If you're going to use them for backups, they need to be licensed. Unfortunately, it gets even worse than that. If all of your secondary servers support no read-only functionality, if all they're doing is sitting there in an untouchable state reading data, you still need to license three of them. Because Microsoft's standard policy with SQL Server licensing is you only get one free secondary server or one free hot secondary server per paid for server. So if you've got five servers in your configuration, you're paying for your, product, your primary server, that gets you your first secondary. You're paying for a sec you, you know, need to pay for your next secondary server, that gives you another secondary server for free. So you now need to pay for your, your fifth server as well. You gotta pay for, you gotta license three of your servers for this five server configuration, which obviously is gonna drive the cost of this thing up way higher than you expected it to be because we were, we were all used to getting secondary service for free, um, even though we you know, haven't gotten any more than the one that we've ever only had. So let's go ahead and take a look at getting this thing set up. So on my laptop here, I have five virtual machines. One is a domain controller. The other four are my always on availability nodes. Oops, I carried it. They don't like it very much when I change screen resolution, so bear with me here. There we go. So the first thing I want to show is failover cluster administrator, which is what you're seeing on the screen right now. You'll notice right now I've got nothing listed in services and applications, and that's because I've got no clustered instances of SQL Server installed on this node. So obviously I already have SQL Server installed and configured, because I've done this demo a dozen times at this point, but nothing is actually clustered here. Now we are going to see something pop up here later, and that's going to be the availability of the listener, so we'll see that in a minute. We've got four nodes set up within our cluster right here, always on one, two, three, and four. And I just want to point out, there is no shared storage in this configuration, so I'm not doing anything special with, with my storage configuration. 
Now, the machine I'm on right now is always on one, so this is one of the four machines that I'll be using that's running SQL Server. And so just to prove that I'm not playing any tricks on you, no shared storage, just a C drive. So the first thing I need to do before I can actually start configuring always on after I've got my SQL Server installed is I actually need to tell SQL Server I'm going to use always on. So I do this by opening up SQL Server Configuration Manager, clicking on SQL Server Services, and finding and double-clicking on the actual SQL Server database engine. You'll notice a new tab listed here. It says Always On High Availability. Click on that. Assuming that you've got Windows clustering configured on all the, all the nodes, or configured on this node, this text box that's grayed out will be filled in, and it'll tell you the name of the failover cluster. In my case, I named the failover cluster Always On. I did that because my domain name is Bacon, so it's Always On Bacon. And this checkbox will be available, but unchecked. So you'll need to check this checkbox, click OK, and then unfortunately, you need to restart SQL Server. You'll need to do this on all the machines that are going to become replicas in your configuration. Once you've done that, you can go into Management Studio and find the Always On High Availability folder in the Object Explorer. Underneath that, you'll see availability groups listed there with nothing underneath it. So let's go ahead and throw something in that. So the, so the database we're going to use is this scale-out database. There we go, we're synchronized to go away. So we're going to use this scale-out database. So this is a very complex database. No, I don't want the diagram. It has one table, and the table has two columns. But we're going to push some data around with it, so we need the table to play with. So to configure the availability group, we we'll right click, go to new availability group wizard, because that's the easiest way to set it up. No, I don't want to activate Windows. Click next, because we don't care about the introduction screen. We need to specify a name for the availability group. So this name can be anything you want, as long as it is a valid SQL Server object name. So 250 characters, you know, don't try, to, don't try not to use any of the funny characters. So we'll call this SQL Days 2012. Click next. So we now get a list of all the databases that are available to us. So as you can see on the screen here, we've got two databases on the server, sample database and scale-up database. Now remember before I had said that full recovery mode is a requirement of this, of using always on. And so you'll notice that the sample database says full recovery mode is required, and the checkbox for that database is grayed out. So Microsoft was actually nice enough to give us information as to why the databases are not available in this wizard in a nice, plain, and simple language instead of using a random error code to go look up. Now, there is another requirement for using this wizard, and that requirement is that you have to have the database backed up, and that backup has to have been taken since you changed the recovery model. So if I change the recovery model on scale-out database to simple and change it back, it will still not be available in this list until I take a full backup of that database. That is not a requirement for configuring always on. That is only a requirement of using this wizard. Klaus's question is why, and because somebody on the product team has a sixth sense of humor, is the only thing I can think of. Because the irony is, when I get through the end of this wizard, it's going to take another full backup. It's not going to use the backup I have. So I have no valid reason why, other than because somebody wanted to. Uh, so we check all the databases that we want to use on the screen. In this case, like I said, we're just going to use one database for, for our demo here. Click Next. So on this screen, we configure the replicas that we want to use. So in my case, I've got a very complex naming structure for my servers. Always on 2. All always on 3. And always on 4. So this, this connection, string, connection dialog that we're seeing right now, this is simply how I'm going to connect to the servers to configure it. The account I'm using is simply my domain account, um, and so you'll simply need to have sysadmin rights on all four of these servers. Um, I've got domain admin rights on the domain since it's allowed, it makes everything easier. So you can see here, I've got, I'm checking two servers for, as available for automatic failover, always on one and two. So those are the two machines that will automatically fail back and forth to in the event of a failover. I'm going to do synchronous commits, or synchronous Mirroring to always on three. 
and asynchronous, which always on four. It's a little bit bigger there. So I can also configure if I want this, these servers to be readable when they're secondaries, or if I want them to not be readable. And there's actually three options on here. No, yes, and read intent only. So no is fairly simple. Don't allow anybody in the database. Well, if I set it to yes, that will allow any user who attempts to connect to that database in, and they will be allowed to run queries against that database with no problem. If I set it to read intent only, this is going to require the use of that read-only routing that I mentioned earlier, where the user actually has to put a new parameter in their connection string, and then that connection string attribute will simply route them to the secondary server. I'm going to show you how that works once I get all this thing set up. I've got an application that I've built specifically to do this. So I'm going to go ahead and set all three of these secondary servers to read intent only. I should have set them all to it. So the reason I'm setting the primary to that as well is because once that server becomes a secondary, it still needs to know how that setting needs to be configured. So if I go to the endpoints tab, uh, these have already been created, because like I said, I've, I've run through this demo before. If they weren't, you'd be able to specify the port number and the endpoint name, where they're grayed out right now. And you'd be able to specify if you wanted data encryption or not. Uh, so in this case, I've simply got the SQL Server running under my domain account, because I'm too lazy to set up another domain account for it. So you can see the domain account listed here. Now, this is another uh, thing to note. All the instances that are running SQL Server Excuse me, that are going to be running as availability group replicas must be running under the same domain account. They cannot be running under local accounts, they cannot be running under system accounts, and they cannot each have their own account. The SQL Server must have a single account running all of the replicas. Yep. No, they all, they all, it'll work if they all have the right rights, but because of SPNs, they all need to be the same because they all have to use and respond with the same SPN. It's in the white papers. Yeah, I was annoyed as hell when I saw that too. On the backend preferences tab, you, this is how you're telling SQL Server how you want, where you want backups to be taken. If you can prefer secondary, so it'll do its best to do it on a secondary server. Tell it only to do it on a secondary server. Only to take backups on a primary server or the backups can be taken anywhere. You can then control the priority level of where you want those backups taken down here on the per uh, instance level. <coughs> um, now, currently, the native backup na uh, tools, basically the native T-SQL commands or the maintenance plans, do not actually use this information for anything. You're configuring this for future use. As far as I know right now, the only backup tool that actually uses this is all the handling these backup scripts. They were just upgraded, I want to say about four to six weeks ago, to actually use this information to figure out where to do your backups. Have they, did they finally fix that? Okay, so the maintenance plans are using it. Okay. Okay, so they're checking. Okay, it didn't work the last time I checked, so I'm glad they finally fixed that. Uh, so the last tab here is to create the availability group listener. Uh, so I'm not going to create it now. I'm actually going to create it in a minute because I want to show you that there are two ways to create it. So if I was to create it right now, I'd simply check this radio button. I'd give it a, a network name of anything. I'd give it a TCP port. Oops. I would always recommend to use TCP port 1433. If you don't, you're going to have to specify the port number in the connection string for all your client applications. Um, there is no named instance here that you're connected to. You're simply connecting to whatever network name you specify here. So some network name. So you would, you would at this point, connect to something called some network name on port 1433. You can select either static IP or DHCP. In my case, I would use DHCP because I don't have static IPs in this environment. But again, I'm not going to create this now, I'm going to create it later. Now, when you, if, when you create the listener, you need the permissions to create an object in Active Directory. Because this is going to create a computer object in, act, in Active Directory. So when I go to create the listener, that's going to work just fine because I'm a domain admin. If you are not a domain admin, 
or do not have rights to create computer accounts in Active Directory, a domain admin is going to need to go do that for you. They, all they need to do is create a computer account, not do anything with it, give it whatever name you're going to give the availability group listener, and they can put it in anywhere they want in the Active Directory or use structure. That part doesn't matter. The object will just need to be created. Then you'll be able to use that automatically when you go to create the listener. So the next screen on the wizard here starts the data synchronization process. So in this case, I'm going to start with full, because I want, to, I want the wizard to handle all this for me. For large production databases, I would not recommend this, because when I do this, it's going to take backups, put them on a server, and then drag those backups across the network to go restore them on other servers. And you don't want to be like Andre and crash your production SharePoint environment by doing this, which he talked about during his presentation earlier today. See, I was paying attention. <laughs> Your other options here are join only or skip initial data synchronization. So if I select the join only, that assumes that I've already done all the backup and restore process on these servers. And so that the full backups have already been taken and restored to the secondaries, and a long backup has already been taken and restored to the secondaries as well. Skip initial data synchronization will simply create the structure and create the replicas. It will not actually do any of the joining of databases to the availability group, because it won't be able to, because we don't know what the structure of the databases is at this point. We can simply do the skip initial data synchronization option now, and then manually back up and restore the databases later, and then just add them into, add them into the, to the process, just using uh, T-SQL at that point. So I'm going to go with full. So I've got, given a network share that all my servers have access to. So it's going to go through and do its testing. So you may have noticed that a new database popped up and disappeared. So keep in mind that when this wizard runs, that second step that took a second to run, it actually creates a new database, backs it up to that network location, and then does a restore with header only from all the other servers as part of the testing. And then it drops that database that it just created. And it's doing that to simply verify that it's got the permissions on that network share to do everything that needs to be done. So if you've got alerts triggered or something set up to prevent databases from being dropped or databases from being created, like a DDL trigger, that's going to cause problems here. You need to disable those DDL triggers or whatever. Or be aware that that alerting is going to fire when you go through this wizard. So you'll notice there's a, a, a warning down here at the bottom that says check the listener configuration. This is simply because I have not selected to create the availability group listener yet. Click next. I get a lovely script. I get a lovely summary of what's going to happen. I can script this out and get a T-SQL script should I desire that I can then run later. If you do script this out and run that script later, the script does need to be run in SQL CMD mode because it is going to be jumping between servers and trying to, as it gets everything set up. Go ahead and hit finish, and if everything goes according to plan, it should get everything set up for me. So you'll notice the first thing it's doing is it's creating a new X event session, a new extended event session on all the servers, and that's how we're going to be monitoring the health of the always on configuration is through that ex the output from that extended event session. Yes, Neil? Does that already exist though? Even if you don't use database groups? Um, this session? This. It's already there, but it so there's, there's going to be an extended event session for each availability group. So this is going to be a, this should be a separate one. So when I deleted the when I reset my demo, the same thing is uh, the health, the school health. That with that there's an extended event session already there. Um, if you have yeah, used very good groups, it's starting, not creating. <laughs> so it would have created it the first time I ran through this. Yeah. Um, so you'll notice there is a warning on this wizard. Uh, on my output here, it says validating WSFC quorum book configuration. This is because I'm not in a technically supported cluster configuration, because I only have four nodes, and I don't have, I need an odd number of nodes, so I would need five nodes to make that, that error message go away. But I don't have enough RAM to run the extra virtual machine. So you can see here, I've now got my always on availability group set up and configured. I've got my four replicas set up, and I've got my one database set up in there. If I want to add more databases, I simply right click, go to add database. It'll give me a nice wizard to run through and take care of adding, that, adding an additional database into this configuration for me. Uh, yes, I don't want 
do it. So the same goes for the replicas. If I want to add a replica, I simply right click on availability of replicas and add another replica in. And the same goes with removing it. Right click, remove from availability. That will simply drop it out of the replication configuration. So I mentioned there was, an, uh, there was a second way to create an availability group listener, and that is from right here. <coughs> Simply right click and go to add listener. I'm going to call it HADR underscore scale up, because that's the name of the connection string on, for this rest of the demo. Again, I'm just going to use port 1433. Uh, in my case, my network is on DHCP, I don't have any static IPs. If I did, I would simply change this to static IP, and I would add in a static IP on the appropriate subnet, and click OK. Let that create it. So this is actually going to Active Directory, creating a computer object, adding the entry into DNS. So if any of those things already exist, it's going to throw an error message back to me. Theoretically, they shouldn't, because they should already be cleaned up. And you'll notice now that I get a new object in Active Directory, in Failover Cluster Administrator. And that object has three, or that resource group has three things in it. Uh, the one I've got highlighted here, this is the actual reference to the always on availability group. The other two things here are the IP address and the network name that I just configured in the availability group listener, which is now done creating. So these things are just all sitting within the cluster administrator. So when this fails over from one server to another, you're actually going to see the IP address and network name stop and then restart on whatever the new server is. Now the catch with this is you don't want to be failing over always on from within the failover cluster administrator that I have on the screen right now. You always want to do the failover from within SQL Server. Because SQL Server, SQL Server needs to be very involved in this failover process. It's not simply a matter of just moving the resources. We also have to do a lot of transaction killing and moving of, and making, you know, bring databases down and bring them up on other servers. So you don't want to be doing your failover from the failover cluster administrator, which means you need to tell your sysadmins to keep the pause off your SQL Server. Because this is for only for us to do the failover. So I had mentioned there's a nice dashboard that's going to be available to you. So you can find that by right clicking on the availability group and going to show dashboard. And this gives you this nice little, nice little display right here that tells you what the health is of the availability group you're looking at. So I don't need to go look at a whole bunch of servers to see how things are set up. I can see that all of my servers are, everything's happy, everything's working, everything's in sync at this point. I can do, I can trigger failover by clicking on Start Failover Wizard. I can click on View Always on Health Events. So this is going to let me view the output of that uh, extended event that, that's up and running. So I scroll to the bottom. Then I'll see that the last thing I did was add a listener, and that I've got no error messages. That error, this error message I received is simply not really an error message. It's more of a warning status information <coughs> saying that the listener was started. Um, unfortunately, there are only a few classifications, and anything that you know error reported is kind of the catch-all. Everything goes there. So while it says error, it doesn't. It may not actually mean that there was an error. So you need to be very careful when, when looking at that. It's very way. Yeah, but not everybody looks at that. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's, it's very intense. It should be you know perfectly, perfectly harmless. You can also view your cluster control cl cluster. Quorum information to see how your cluster is set up for a quorum. Uh, but just going to click on view, view cluster quorum information. Uh, that last column vote count is there for future use. In other words, Windows Server 2012. When that becomes released, that column will become more useful than saying not available. So if I want to trigger failover, the easiest way to do it is from this dashboard. Simply click on the start failover wizard. Click next. Select the server that you want to be the new primary server. Keep in mind that if I click, and see, if I use the asynchronous one, I will have to rebuild all my other servers because they are no longer going to be considered valid because they're going to. There's the possibility that they are a newer version of the database than the, the asynchronous copy. So go ahead and select the server I want to use. Click next. I have to connect to it. So again, this is just me connecting to that server because I need to run T-SQL commands from that server. With uh, database mirroring, when we did failover, you did the trigger the failover from the primary server. 
you now trigger the fail over from the secondary server that you're failing over to, so they fixed that annoyance. Made it work a little more sensibly. So I connect to the server always on two, click next, and click finish. So if I, I can also trigger failover by right clicking on the availability group and then selecting start failover, and that'll bring up the exact same wizard. Now if I select, if I'm on a secondary server, and I bring this wizard up, it'll look exactly the same. The exception being, and I'll show you that to you right now, the list of servers that I can fail over to will only be the server that I'm currently on. Because the server I'm currently on does not want to try to go out to the other secondaries and try to trigger failover. So I had mentioned that I've got a little application that I want to use as part of my demo. So here it is. It's a very complex application. It's just going to simply add new rows in with one thread and it's going to read rows out with the other threads. So right now, always on two is the server that I'm writing to. Started, so it's going to start loading rows. So I had mentioned a new connection string parameter, and that's this one right here: application intent equals read only. So because I've got that parameter in there, once I've configured read only routing, which I haven't done just yet, that is going to tell it to go take those connections and move them to a secondary server. So let's go ahead and start reading. I'm just getting a bunch of threads spun up here. So right now, everything is connecting to always on two because I don't have the read-only routing in place yet. So I'm going to go ahead and connect to always on 2 because that's my primary server, and open up my read-only routing script. So I'm basically doing two statements in here, but I'm doing each of them four times. I have to do them four times because I've got four servers in my configuration. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm setting up the read-only routing URL for each of the instances, for when those instances are going to be secondary servers. So basically, what I'm doing, alter availability group, scale out, and I'm going to change that to the right name, because I just gave it something else. Oops. SQL days 2012. Yep. So I'm doing alter availability group, SQL days 2012. Modify replica always on one and set its read only routing URL to always on one dot bacon dot lab colon fourteen thirty three. And I repeat that for all four of the instances. The second thing I need to do here, if I make this a little bigger, make it a little easier to see. The second thing I need to do here is alter the availability of the group again, modify replica one with primary role, and then give it a read-only read routing list. So this is just simply a comma-separated list telling me what instances I want to use when each of these servers is the primary server. So when always on one is primary, I want to go to always on two is my read-only server, and if that server is not available, I'm going to go to always on three. When always on two is primary, which should be this line right here, I want to go to always on three, and then always on one. When always on three is primary, I want to go to always on one, and then always on two. And if always on four is primary, if always on one or two are up, I'm going to use those. Now, if always on, if I'm on a server and it's primary, and the two secondary servers are down, the connection will actually come back to my primary server. The end user will not receive an error message. So we'll go ahead and run that. So the way this read-only routing works is the client makes a connection to the primary server, passing the application intent equals read only connection string attribute. The primary server sees that attribute coming in, and if read only routing is configured, tells the client, disconnect from me and go to this other server. So you'll see a real short connection come in, and then you'll see the, the serve, you'll see a disconnect from that server, and then you'll actually go connect to the other server automatically. So if I kill all these read-only windows here, I'm just going to kill the whole lot real fast. Read threads. So you'll see now the read threads are now running on the always on three server. So all of the only configuration I've changed at this point is the fact that I can run that script and configure the read-only routing. So the reason these didn't switch over automatically before is simply because this application does not disconnect. 
It simply connects and starts running, running select statements. And all I'm doing is just counting the number of rows that are in the table. It's not exactly a complex application. So what I want to go ahead and do now is fail over. So I'll right click, fail over. Then I'm just going to go ahead and fail back to always on one. So as soon as I finish this wizard, I'm going to switch back. So we're going to see error messages pop up because we can no longer access the database in question because we're moving stuff around. You'll see the rights of Halton. They're going to start back up again in a second because I've got reconnection logic built into my application. So it's, re it's starting back up. My read-only clients are going to attempt to reconnect in a minute here. And once they do, they're going to go ahead and start re returning data again. You'll notice it does take them a little while to actually do that, but it does kick in in a second here. So they've actually now reconnected and they're, they're running queries again. And apparently they've switched over all the way on three, where they should be on two. Okay, I'll take what I can get. But they are still connected to a different server, so that workload is still offloaded from my primary box. So I don't have to worry about these guys sitting there chewing and processing cycles on my primary server. And failure is completed. You can see that in management studio here. You can see we're synchronized. And we're synchronized here as well. So um, you'll notice we can't actually get into the database because I am in read intent only. So I think I'm just about out of time. Uh, yeah, eight minutes left. So any questions? I've covered a lot of material in a very short period of time. Yes, sir? Yes, I've got a question about the uh, backup of uh, Hub. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know uh, is, if I understand it correctly. When when I got hard and I got the primary server and some replicas, mm -hmm. I can do a log backup on replica and the foul f on the primary server will be zero, so I can uh, roll roll forward the transaction log. Yes. Correct. Yeah. So you can you can, be, you can take your full backups and your log backups can be taken on either your primary or any of your secondaries that are configured to allow it. Um, you, now, you cannot take differential backups on a secondary server. So if you do take differential backups as part of your backup process, those must be taken on the primary server. Um, but yeah, your transaction log backups can be offloaded to a secondary. When the backup is taken, the, uh, the secondary will send a, a message to the primary server telling it which VLFs have been cleared, and the, the VLFs will then be marked as cleared in the primary, and that clearing of VLFs will then be replicated out to the secondaries as well. Uh, so the question was, do you need to license your, your server if all you're doing is taking backups with it? And unfortunately, the answer is yes. I got that from the head guy at licensing. We, we did not have a pleasant conversation. Okay, and, and if we are not taking any backups on the replica, just using it for always on? Uh, so the, the follow-up was, so if we're only using the server as the backup, in the, or in, as a secondary, that's not read-only, we're not taking any backups on it. Yes, basically you have to you have to license every other server. So if we've got a full full five node configuration, this is my primary. I get one one secondary for free. I license the next one. I get the next one for free. I get to license the last one. So if we have two, we just need to one license, right? If if you only have one secondary, yeah, yeah you only need one license, just like you do today for this cluster. No other question. Not a cool new feature. Uh, so the question was, is there a limit to the number of availability groups? I believe right now it's 250. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a number that's large enough that 99% of customers won't hit it. And if you do hit it, I have business cards. Because I don't want to be using that environment. Um, so there's my contact info. Um, if you think of anything that 
you do get asked today, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm more than happy to answer questions. Um, second link there is my blog. Uh, my website, www.mrdenny.com, has links to my blogs as well. Uh, my Twitter URL is there, is there as well. Um, I think all the sponsors have bailed at this point, but just in case they haven't, um, if you see them upstairs in the, in the break room or the lunch room, please do be sure to thank them. Uh, events like this are not possible without the help of the sponsors. Um, so thank you all very much for coming. Uh, enjoy the one remaining session we have left today, which I believe is Mr. Neal. Um, thank you all for coming. I hope you had a great time this weekend. I know I sure did. Uh, thank you for inviting me to your beautiful city. Um, I had a great time here. Well, thank you very much.